All right. Well, it is one o'clock according to my uh, clock here, so we will get started. Um, just wanted to welcome everybody to our Reliable Asset World Preview webinar. Um, we always like to do this just to kind of give everybody a little taste of what's to come at our conference that we're just about uh, just two months out from now. Um, so I appreciate you all taking the time to join us. I know it's uh, a day you could be out drinking green beer and watching a lot of basketball, but hopefully you've got your brackets uh, next to you and you can kind of be keeping an eye on them. I know I've got mine sitting right here too. So uh, anyhow, appreciate uh, you all taking some time today to join us. And I definitely appreciate uh, Sean Eisenhower taking some time out of his day to, to kind of walk us through this presentation. Um, instead of, you know, just trying to go through, obviously you all can go to our website and read the abstracts and, and kind of see that for yourself. So, you know, that's not what Sean's here to do, um, but rather, you know, knowing what the topics are going to be, kind of sharing that with you all. And then he's going to actually be talking through a little bit more about each of those topics and, and give you some, some meat today as well. So, um, you know, hopefully you'll walk away here with with learning a few things and also hopefully you'll walk away uh, wanting to, to get signed up right away for the conference because we would love, love, love to have you down at Clearwater Beach with us. Um, so just a couple things before I turn it over to Sean. Um, so, you know, obviously this is about our conference, uh, Reliable Asset World, but um, we also have another conference, Ultrasound World, which some of you might be more familiar with, and kind of the whole evolution of how we got to having these two events co-located together was obviously we started with our Ultrasound World conference. We brought customers in. They kind of would give case studies on how they were using ultrasound in their facilities. We'd make sure the different applications were covered. And, you know, it was obviously definitely kind of more like a user's event, right? Um, but over the years, we found ourselves stuffing more and more reliability centered presentations into it to where all, you almost kind of had to look hard to find where the ultrasound talks were. So uh, three years ago, we decided, well, let's pull the reliability stuff out, have a separate conference, but it's really more like a separate track, if you will. So if you go to other conferences like SMRP, where you've got six different tracks of sessions to, to attend, kind of think of it like that. So now we've got this reliability track and of course our ultrasound track. So with the ultrasound world, now we're kind of back to our roots where we can really bring in lots of customers and we've got a great lineup and we'll talk more about that in two weeks when we have a, a webinar previewing that event. But now that one's really back to, to being all about ultrasound. And we've got this Reliable Asset World Conference where we can really, you know, fill it with just the, the top, you know, industry th thought leaders that we can find sharing best practices and asset management, the business side of things, and just really fill it with, with lots of good tips and advice for those of you who are ready to take your um, program to the next level. So, with kind of that little understanding, again, Sean's here to, to kind of walk us through what we can expect at the Reliable Asset World Conference. So just a couple housekeeping things. Um, I am recording this, so if you have to hop off early, you can definitely check the rest of it out later. If you've got a colleague that that you wish, you know, had taken some time to listen in, um, you, we can, you know, they can view this at a later date. And also, we'd love for you to ask questions as we go through the presentation today. So you can type those into the little questions box. I'll be keeping an eye on those, and I'll toss those questions over to Sean um, so that he can get them answered for you. So I'm um, trying to make it as interactive as we can, knowing we're all, you know, spread out around uh, the country and, and the globe. Um, so, and if we have any technical issues, you know, we are doing this live, so I just always like to make that point. Um, you know, we'll do what we can to, to quickly resolve it, but you never know when the internet's going to get slow on us or something silly. So uh, bear with us if something like that happens, but we'll, we'll have our fingers crossed that it doesn't. So I have done enough rambling. I am now going to uh, switch the screen over to Sean and let him get things started. Sean, you might still have yourself muted, because if I know you, you probably are talking, but we can't hear you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Maureen. You got it. <laughs> All right. Welcome, everybody. Uh, Maureen, can you see my screen? Yes. It's not in uh, slideshow view yet, though. We're so now, no problem. I think should... you're, now you're good. Awesome. Perfect. Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, we're going to spend the next 30, 45 minutes just kind of looking at some of the presentations that have already been submitted. Uh, I'm going to add a little bit of detail and a little bit of commentary to some of the sections. 
um, just to kind of give you some ideas for what you might expect to see. Um, I really like to start with this graphic because it's one that really I, I think can can uh, can help us understand why conferences like this conference are really important to recalibrating us as we go through our liability journey. And this data, or the data that actually supports the, uh, the graphic you see on the screen in front of you, originally came from the aviation industry. And it was based on the fact that many pilots, when they hit the 500 to 800 hour um, experience level, they, they become a little, for lack of a better word, a little arrogant um, in their flying. And what you would see is that there were quite a few of these pilots that would be involved in crashes or incidents. And when the, when the FAA started looking at that information, they realized very quickly that it was almost always in that five to eight hundred range where they would feel a little too comfortable in the airplane or the helicopter, and that would lead to a failure. Um, but I think this applies very much to our reliability walk as well. And if you look at it, uh, what we've got is knowledge perception versus time. And in that beginner zone, we're all really hungry to learn new things, and we, we don't necessarily assume that we have all the answers. Uh, we really don't even know how much there is to know at that point. Um, but then there's that danger zone, the red area on my graphic. Uh, and what you think or what you see there especially is the big yellow hill. Uh, representing how much I think I know. And uh, this is, again, straight from the aviation side, but how many times have you seen people within your organization believe that they were masters of reliability or masters of, of a vibration technology or an ultrasound technology? Um, I think conferences like this one are a great opportunity for us to talk to other people and really pull ourselves back down out of that danger zone and, and transfer over into the expert zone. I know every time I go to one of these conferences, I learn something new. I find something that I wasn't aware of from the past. So it, it's always uh, just a great experience to hear what the really good uh, performers are doing, uh, how they're progressing and learning new things, and uh, what I can do differently or do to improve. So, you know, as you, as you go across this graphic, you, our hope is to get more and more of our folks into that expert zone where they realize how much they don't know, but how much they would like to learn going forward. Now, the next one I've got here, we're going to start into the actual presentations. And one of the keynotes is going to be by Bob Kazar. Uh, he works for the wonderful company. And he's going to be talking a lot about his experience in the industry. And I can't speak for Bob, but I can definitely speak for myself. And I noticed that he's going to uh, be talking about his involvement in the organization, uh, Society for Maintenance and Reliability Professionals. Um, I was also a board member and, and was the chairman of SMRP a few years back. Uh, I spent about 12 years in this organization, and I can honestly say that you know, it really helped me get through that danger zone that I showed you in the previous slide. Um, being able to talk with folks that have been doing this for 20 or 30 years, being able to see what the best practice facilities are doing, those are all things that you can experience through uh, the Society of Maintenance and Reliability Professionals. So Bob's going to talk more about that, but also a lot about his background and his history, and I think that'll be a, a wonderful presentation to just give us an idea of, of what this career path of reliability can look like. Now the next area I thought I would touch on is vision and mission because one of our speakers is going to be talking about vision and I've got a slide up here. This is what I call a single point lesson. It's got a couple of learning models that you can take a look at. Uh, it has some key descriptions and why you should care and then a few sources as well so that you can see, uh, see kind of what's going on there. Um, the, uh, I think the best thing to, to, to mention here is, uh, is the core circle that you see. And I'm going to take you through this path and, and kind of read it through to you. But as I look back on a lot of the facilities that I've watched over the years try to improve reliability and asset management and just even implementing some simple processes, um, if they didn't have a clear vision, they really struggled to get an implementation that would move forward. So the first purple box you see there is, do you have a clear and concise vision? All right, that's the first question I would ask that you guys ask yourselves about what you're doing within your facility. 
The second question in the blue box or the bluish gray box, how or have you and your leadership team practiced communicating that vision in your own words? And I think back to a paper mill I worked with years ago that they did a really, really good job uh, in this piece. They created a vision, but what they realized pretty quickly was that you know, an ops manager might communicate that those same words a little differently than an HR manager or a maintenance manager or an engineering manager. So they took time to sit in that leadership team uh, meeting and really articulate the message to each other so that when they left that leadership team meeting they were all speaking the same intent or the same vision even though they may use different words. And uh, I think that's definitely a best practice for a lot of folks that are looking at creating a vision for improvement. Now the next box you see is the green box. It talks about uh, have you shared that vision with the whole organization? And I would even go so far as to say and with multiple medias. So, you know, not everyone's going to want to hear someone convey it verbally, but if you were to put it into a small learning model like this, they may spend a little time with it. Or maybe you put it on the uh, closed circuit TVs within the facility and, and use video. The, the point here is once you've got that vision, once you've learned how you're going to communicate that vision, you just really have got to focus on making sure that everyone gets exposure and gets exposure in multiple medias. The next area you see is the green box. Did you check for understanding? And I think this is crucial. And I, I'm not going to take the time today to share too many of the stories, but over the years I've watched a lot of facilities go out and communicate their vision and what they communicated and what was received by the individuals were two completely different things. Um, so I think you know it's got to be two-way communication. You can convey that vision out to the organization, but you need to ask them what they've heard and have them talk back to you about what they believe that means to them. Now the next box you see as we transfer up and around the circle is have you empowered others to act toward that vision with a mission and a plan? So in other words, what are the steps that we're going to take to get to that vision that we've created moving forward? Once we get that, have we empowered the organization to do it? Or are we trying to use uh, a, an old champion model where I'll do everything and I'll get all the credit? So what are you doing to make sure that you're getting every bit of that out to the organization so that they can do what needs to get done and they can take the credit for the success. That will give you a lot more sustainability on the other side. The last box you see before we loop back around is the brown box and it says do you celebrate your success or did you celebrate your success? So once you start to get good things happening in pockets across the facility, what are you doing to celebrate those? What are you doing to pull them together? Because the idea is if we can get the vision out in a pilot area have success in that pilot area, instead of having to push it out to the rest of the organization, we can create a pull where they'll be pulling on us to make this vision a reality in their areas. A few other key facts on the slide that you can review later if you'd like, um, but I think the, the, the key point and, and what the speaker is going to talk about is the fact that this vision is your North Star. It is your guiding light that you will use as you move through your implementation. So in the keynote, um, Ron Bightley is going to talk a little bit about his North Star and what he's doing at Arizona Chemical. Uh, and so I think that's going to be a great presentation. I'm sure he'll dive even deeper into it than what I've done today, but I think it'll give you something to take back and really start to figure out for your facility, what is our North Star? What is our vision? Where do we want to be in 18 months to two years? Now the next area is a workshop that I will be doing. This is a pre-conference workshop and we're going to be talking about problem solving in that workshop. And what I've got here is another single point lesson. Uh, a really quick one. We're just going to focus on the center of the slide. Um, but in the next two or three minutes, I'm going to teach you three of the tools that we're going to use. And then we'll get into a little more of the detail in the pre-conference workshop. But what you see on the, on the graphic in front of you, if you look, there are five blue boxes going down the center of the screen. That represents a, a tool that you may be familiar with called Five Whys. You start with a problem in the big box at the top, and then you ask yourself, well, why did that happen? 
and then you get the answer to that question and again you find yourself asking okay but why did that happen and you drill down into the problem so that's a tool called five wise very popular within the lean culture um, but it really isn't enough for a lot of problem solving um, the reason is it only looks at one branch or it only looks at one causal chain so what we can do is we can branch that five wise out by adding the gray boxes you see around it now what we've created is a fault tree. It's a 5Y, but it's been branched at each of the areas. Now the last tool that we talk about in these, this set of tree tools is called the logic tree. And the logic tree is simply adding the AND and the OR symbol to the existing fault tree. And now I can see how various things have to exist in order for the thing above it to occur. When you transition from five wise by branching into fault tree and then into logic tree by adding the and and or, it allows you to do the, the amount of problem solving you need for the problem that you have. We're going to teach three or four other uh, tools as well as some pre-analysis steps that you can take and we'll talk a little bit about processes in the, the pre-conference workshop. But I wanted to at least show you guys how we can use those tools and branch them out. I'm going to give you one quick example. Uh, it's one that I think makes the point as to why you need to be able to branch out. Um, let's say we had a fire in your office right now. In order to have that fire, we would have to have oxygen in the area. We would have to have a fuel source, and we would have to have an ignition source. If all I were using was the 5Y, I would only go after one of those chains. So if I chose to go after the ignition source, I might end up having to make everything in the room explosion proof or, or something to that magnitude in order to really reduce the risk. But what I may be able to do now that I've branched it out is see that there's a fuel source and that fuel source is all the papers that are sitting on my desk that I haven't cleaned up in months. And in reality, I could eliminate the potential for reoccurrence of this failure by simply cleaning my desk up. So on one hand, if I were using 5Ys, I could be or having to spend thousands and thousands of dollars on equipment that is explosion proof. On the other hand, I may spend a couple of hours and maybe put a process in place to make sure that my desk doesn't get cluttered in the future. So that's why we do this, and that's part of the tools, and we'll spend a lot more time with them uh, during the workshop. I hope you can join me. So here's a quick look at, at the workshop and a little more of the detail. I won't read it to you, but... Uh, um, just want to let you see it here for just a second. All right, so the next couple of presentations we're going to talk about are around change management and projects. And um, what I've done here is I, another one of our single point lessons up that hit a lot of these points. Now, we're really only going to focus on one part of this today. We're going to focus down where you see the letters A, D, K, A, R. And here, I think this is something you can use at the conference, use for the material you bring back from the conference to really be more successful in helping folks change within your organization. So what this model, it's called the ADCAR model. It comes from an organization called ProSci and an individual by the name of Jeffrey Hyatt. And what he noticed is that if he learned something new at a conference, for instance, and wanted to bring that back to his facility. The first thing he had to do within the facility was to create awareness for why they should care about this new thing that he brought back from the conference. If he could create awareness and really convey what's in it for them and how it would benefit them, then he could create DESIRE, the second letter in the acronym ADCAR. Once he created the desire, he could then teach the individuals at his facility all the things he learned around that subject from the conference, representing the knowledge portion of the ADCAR model. Then following on, he could check for ability and seeing that they could actually use the knowledge that he had conveyed, and then he might put in reinforcing metrics to make sure that the new way of doing business stays the new way. So that's a simple model for thinking about how you change an individual. Um, and I think as you come back from the conference, you can think about this as well in presenting things back to your organization. So one of the presentations you'll be able to see at the conference is developing a winning business plan. 
how to begin your development of a reliability culture. And this is going to be from uh, Joe Shaver from JM Smucker Company. And he's going to be talking through how they created their business plan and, and how you go about justifying the time and energy it, it takes to change reliability culture. Now the next couple papers I noticed were referencing metrics and I thought I would take just a few minutes to talk about one of the really good sources for metrics within your facility. Uh, this is the um, front page from the SMRP library. You can get to it by going to www.smrp.org and then clicking down into the, the, uh, the library. And in there you can see a lot of the metrics that they have available. I think this is a great source, especially if you're working with other plants to make sure that you're comparing apples to apples, that you're calculating your metrics the same way, that you're using the same points, um, and that you're including all the same values into that calculation. There are, um, I can't remember how many anymore, 60, 70, 80 of these metrics available now, um, but there's quite a few of them available, and they're even available in a compendium like the one that I'm showing you now. This is just a couple pages. This is page one and page nine of one of the metrics that were that is in the compendium. Um, so this is nine pages of information on TEEP. All right, so you can find out what total effective equipment performance is. You get a definition. You get the objectives. You get the formula. You get information on how it's calculated. For a lot of the metrics, you can even see best practices and what the, the values would be. Um, so it's a great resource if you're fighting that battle to define the metrics within your facility. If you're a member of SMRP, it is free to you, so definitely check it out as part of your SMRP membership. Now here's a presentation, um, and this presentation from Kimberly Clark is going to take them through, or take you through, a lot of the metrics that they're using to improve their asset reliability programs. I love these because you get to hear you know exactly what's happening when they put the metric in place. A lot of times they'll share with you the the unintentional consequences that occur uh, as they put one metric in and understand how it drives behavior. So you can learn a lot from these presentations specifically around what metrics work for them but also where they had to make changes and tweaks um, because of the unintended consequences. Now the next area seems to be a very hot topic in the uh, marketplace right now. I know I've seen this very um, this very acronym on the cover of a couple different magazines just in the last couple months. It's something they call IIoT or the Industrial Internet of Things. Now I like to have a little more fun with it. I think the Industrial Internet of Things is just one letter away from idiot. You've got a lot of data but you've got to figure out what you're going to do with it. And my point here is, you know, it's not that the industrial Internet of Things is a bad thing. It actually is great, but it provides you with so much data that you've really got to understand how are you going to process that data? How are you going to analyze it? And I think one of the big pieces here, and I think we're seeing more and more of this over the last few years, is now that all this big data is coming in from all of these individual sensors and pieces of the equipment um, that make up that industrial internet of things, um, it's algorithms. It's an algorithm that looks at that current draw or looks at that weight or that pressure or that vibration sensor or any one of these these elements that are out there providing that data and compares them all in unison. As we get stronger and stronger with our algorithms, I think we'll see more and more ability to identify failures earlier on the P to F curve. I'll show you the P to F curve in a few minutes if you haven't seen that before, but it's, it's one of the tools that we can use to really understand how equipment fail and why identifying these things early is very important. Now in the presentation, one of the presentations that you'll see at the conference, they're going to talk a little bit about some of the software that you can use to mine big data, and I imagine they'll also talk about some of the algorithms. So you can listen for uh, David Riber's presentation, and he's going to talk about having the right systems and tools to operate at a high level in this new information age. So now that we've got this Internet of Things or this industrial Internet of Things that is providing us so much more data than what we've had in the past, he'll tell us a little bit about how they're managing all that data to make meaningful decisions. Another
another area where we have more data than we've ever had, uh, and it's really interesting to, to think about what this means, is how we manage energy moving forward. For those of you that are using the ultrasonic tools, you know that you can identify very quickly leaks within your organization's um, pneumatic systems. You're able to uh, check through the lines and find loose connections and all those sort of things and save a lot of energy there. But now what we're seeing is, especially with all the data that's available, we can really start to see even earlier, before the leak occurs, other areas where we're losing energy, maybe because of um, a, a motor that's failing and consuming or increasing its amp draw and consuming more money from that standpoint. There's a lot to be said there and, and Nick from Groom Energy is going to take us through a look at what we can do to save on energy cost. And on the next section, there were quite a few presentations about preventive, predictive, and precision maintenance. So I put this single point lesson up just to take a quick look at one concept down in the left-hand corner. You see the I to P to F curve. And just like, just like what I mentioned with all the big data that is coming into the industry, the predictive tools and big data together allow us to de detect problems earlier than we ever could in the past. Um, and so, you know, you got to ask, okay, what's that worth to me or what does that mean? And, and my, my biggest thought about that is that if you look at this I to P to F curve, if I can use analytics, if I can use predictive technologies, I'll have a chance to detect this failure very early on in the, um, in the life cycle or the failure cycle of this piece of equipment. By doing that, the key product, and I'll talk more about this as I wrap up this section, but the key product is that if I can detect it earlier, I can plan and schedule that work. And if I can plan and schedule that work, I can reduce the cost of the repair, I can reduce the chances of a failure that leads to downtime, uh, that leads to lost production. I can also reduce the chances of that failure causing other failures, increasing the cost and the effect of the overall problem. So if you haven't seen the I to P to F curve before, um, I think it's something that you can really use as a model to help folks see that if I can detect these things early, it'll allow me the time to truly do a repair at a lower cost. I'll give you one statistic that you can take away. Um, based on numerous studies, and I saw one even just recently at the Marcon conference in, at the University of Tennessee, um, the repair or the cost to do an emergent or an emergency repair is between five and eight times the cost of a planned and scheduled job execution. So just think about that. If you're doing everything down there where you're detecting it when it makes a noise or when it's hot, and you're just basically doing a, a emergent repair, you will be spending anywhere from five to eight times as much from a maintenance standpoint. So here's a couple of those technologies and a couple of those tools. I'm uh, really looking forward to Klaus talking about uh, um, the role of predictive technologies in gaining a competitive advantage. Uh, Klaus has got a lot of great data from the surveys that he's been doing at the University of Tennessee, and he's going to share those observations with us. He's going to talk a little bit about some of the issues that, that, that he is seeing in that data and the role that PDM is playing in making a lot of companies more competitive. So I think that'll be a great presentation. I think it'll be a lot of great data that we can take back and share with other data-driven folks within our organization to help drive forward the use of predictive maintenance. Now the next area you see here uh, is, is a focus on precision lubrication. And I say this definitely falls in the precision maintenance category. I think it's an area that probably has a lot of effect on a lot of facilities when they really focus and dive into it. I know as an individual who's done a lot of root cause investigations over the years for a lot of facilities, it's amazing how often I find those problems were driven simply by the lack of precision lubrication or the lack of precision maintenance. Using a hammer to install a bearing or using whatever lubrication is available because all grease is the same, you know, these are the kind of problems that we see that drive a lot of the failures that we face. And you know, the bad thing about precision lubrication or precision maintenance in general, if your organization doesn't understand it, is that you have to pay for the sins 
of that lack of precision for years in the future because those failures, even though they don't happen immediately necessarily when you start the equipment up, that seal that was that was shoved in with a screwdriver will fail a lot short in a lot shorter time than than a properly installed seal would long term. Now another area in the predictive maintenance world that I think will be very interesting, uh, Andy Page from Allied Reliability is going to be talking about their OptiVibe technology. Uh, I did have the opportunity to be a part of uh, working with some of this technology early on and it is an absolutely incredible technology to see. Uh, the technology allows you to basically see vibration. So it uses a camera and it measures the movement of the individual pixels on that camera and allows you to interpret that into individual vibration spectrums. Um, so it's, it's, it's pretty unique. Uh, it's, it really gives us data that we've never had a way to see in the past. And I think if you get a few minutes and you can sit down and, and enjoy this presentation, it'll probably be a bit mind-blowing. Um, I know when I saw the, the first piece of equipment with the gear, I saw things that I had never seen before, everything from phase shifts, and, and, and in the past there was just no way to see that because the data would have to be taken one point at a time. So look forward to that presentation. I think that will be a good one for you guys to attend as well. Now the next area, or the next presentation, Tim's going to be talking about uh, electrical electrical condition monitoring and this presentation he's going to really talk about what are your responsibilities especially with the changing safety standards and uh, I think this is it behooves all of us to really know where this is going because I don't think we're very far from the day that when a piece of equipment fails if it were to injure someone um, the responsibility is going to fall back on those that aren't using the tools that they need to identify these defects as early as possible. So especially if you're, if you're focusing on asset management as a whole and risk management is a big part of what you're doing, uh, Tim's presentation could really add a lot of value. I know Tim spends a lot of time uh, working with the standards boards that develop these. Now if you take all that predictive maintenance and all of that big data that we saw in that last section, I thought I would take the last little bit or the last few minutes here to talk a little bit about what you do with that. You know, if all you do is go out into the facility and collect a whole bunch of data, uh, you've got your industrial internet of things pumping back a whole lot of data, you've got your predictive tools identifying failures all over the facility. If you're not really truly managing how you how you get that work completed, um, that's where you're going to lose a lot of the value. If I identify the failure really early but I don't plan and schedule the work, all I've really done is add a lot of volume of work to my already run to failure strategy. So this funnel is a good representation of kind of how that works. If you're using big data or you're using the predictive tools, they're identifying those raindrops that you see up there uh, near the forecast cloud. Once those uh, jobs are identified as uh, failures that need to be repaired, they then can be approved for the repair. When they're approved for the repair, they become part of the funnel. Uh, in fact, they become part of what we call the total backlog of work. Um, that total backlog of work typically in a, in a world-class facility will be somewhere around four to six weeks of work, meaning that if you took all of your maintenance craftsmen and dedicated them only to the work that it was in the total backlog, it would take them four to six weeks to burn through every bit of it. So once you get that total backlog in there, uh, we will then push that work through the planner and the scheduler organization, and they, the planner will convert that work into ready backlog. Ready backlog is typically two to four weeks and if I create that ready backlog, I can then control the neck of the funnel as a maintenance manager and really just have the amount of resources I need to do the amount of work that's being identified through my process. So just to kind of go back through this thing, all of us out there with the predictive technologies are generating that forecasted work that is coming into the total backlog. 
the planner is taking that total backlog and converting it into ready backlog by making sure the parts are available, making sure the tools are available, and making sure that there's a job plan for each of those jobs. Now the PM work that we do using the predictive technologies or the preventive means, it, it just travels right straight through that straw you see in the middle because that should really be about 15% of the work you're doing um, on both accounts. So 15% preventive maintenance, 15% predictive maintenance. If you've taken the time to kind of load level your work within your facility, that's a constant flow through the phone. So again, the last area is the neck of the funnel, and this is where the maintenance engineer, or I'm sorry, the, uh, the uh, reliability supervisor or reliability manager or maintenance manager is controlling the volume of work that can be done on a regular basis. So if we start identifying a whole lot of work coming from the forecast, then that needs to get communicated to the maintenance manager, and he's going to open the size of the neck of this funnel so that we get more work done. Because what we don't want to happen is for that total backlog to get so full that it overflows across the top of that funnel and spills out into emergent work. All right? So a couple of key points to kind of take away from this graphic, and these are over in the key facts. 15% of the work that you're doing by labor hours should be preventive maintenance in an ideal facility. Uh, in a facility that is, is best practice is running good maintenance programs and in that situation you'll also see 15% predictive maintenance. You'll see 15% of the work that they're doing is generated from their PM program and 35% of the work that they're pushing through this funnel is generated from their PDM program. 10% of the work that's moving through the funnel is going to be in projects and the remainder of the work will fall out in emergence. Uh, repairs. We know that even in the best facilities we have to understand that there will still be some emergencies that happen. The other key facts to remember, as I mentioned, total backlog should be about four to six weeks. We don't want the funnel overflowing with 50 weeks and I have seen that in multiple plants over the years. On the flip side, we don't want uh, the ready backlog to run out. We want to be able to build enough ready backlog there that we can pull work from that ready backlog to create the schedules, to, to build the schedules moving forward one, two, three, even four weeks out into the future so that we really can make the best use of the people we have and the time we have from a downtime standpoint. So that's a little bit about backlog management. Just keep in mind from a predictive maintenance standpoint, we're feeding this funnel. Uh, no matter what tool we're using, uh, whether it's the OptiVibe or the Ultrasonic or even the big data and uh, the analytics that we looked at early on, all of those are going to be feeding this funnel. We have to manage the neck of that funnel and keep maintenance at the lowest cost while, while it's not creating any additional risk. A couple other things that are going to happen at the conference I think you'll find fairly interesting. Um, if you're not certified, there are going to be three certification exams given during uh, the conference. Uh, the first being the Certified Maintenance and Reliability Professional, or the CMRP. This is a great, uh, a great way to really feature that you understand all of the body of knowledge. Everything from maintenance engineering and reliability engineering, all the way over to planning and scheduling and work control, and even materials management. Uh, and people skills. It's all included in that CMRP exam. So if you don't have that, that CMRP, that can be a great certification to really start to feature um, what you know in the broader picture. The next exam that will be given is the Certified Maintenance and Reliability Technician or the CMRT exam. Again, another great exam really shows that you understand how to be a technician in a modern, man in a modern manufacturing facility. Now, I said manufacturing, but facilities could use this certification as well. It's not, it's not, it's not focused so much that it couldn't service both sides, of the, uh, both sides of the coin. Now, the last certification that you see there is the Certified Asset Management Assessor Exam. This is a new exam. In fact, the first time this exam was ever given in the U.S., it was given at this conference last year. Um, 
So you've got an opportunity to take this exam, especially if you're interested in the asset management world. Um, and I would say, as, you know, if if you see your organization wanting to assess how they fit against the ISO 55000 standards, as well as the broader body of knowledge around asset management, this could be the exam that you want to sit for while you're at the conference. And of course, there'll be continuing education units uh, offered that you can use towards recertification of all of those exams you see above. So, great opportunity to learn some really cool new things from all the speakers that will be speaking during the conference, to then take the exam so that you've got the proof that you understand these concepts as you go back into the workplace, and then use some of those things we talked about earlier on, like the ADCAR model, to take it back and help to train other people within your organization so that the organization as a whole can be more successful. So as Maureen talked about earlier, and I'll hit this again, uh, Ultrasound World will also be co-located with Reliable Asset World. So not only will you have the ability to go through the Reliable Asset World tracks, you're going to be able to jump over into the Ultrasound tracks as well. So if you see a topic over there or something that you're facing within your facility, you can get the benefit of two conferences at the same time. So with that, I want to thank all of you for taking the time today. I'm going to turn it back over to Maureen and let her uh, ask any questions she might have. All right, great. Well, thanks, Sean. That was a very, very good uh, kind of summary of what, what to expect and then, you know, obviously kind of teasing us with, with some new things as well. So hopefully that uh, was beneficial to everybody that participated. If you do have questions, you can type those in. Um, one question that I'll just toss out because I know, you know, this is something you're pretty passionate about as far as, you know, making the most of of the education that you're able to get your hands on and how you really make sure you not only retain it for yourself, but how you can really bring it back. And you touched on that a little bit um, as far as, you know, bringing that knowledge back and how to, how to make that impact. But maybe you could just kind of talk through a little bit about sort of what you, at least for yourself, use as kind of those best practices of, okay, I'm going to go to this conference and this is how I make sure I not only get the best of it for myself, but I, I get that value that I bring back uh, so that hopefully the next time I ask to go to a conference again, you know, they let me out to do it. Absolutely. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to retain control of the slides here for just a second. I'm going to take us back a couple slides um, and show you one of the tools that I use. So this this single point lesson format that I that I was showing you guys and, and kind of walking you through for some of the content today, some people also refer to it as a one point lesson. You can take these and print them out in advance, and I have done this before. And you, you, you clean out all of the topic description and why you should care and the, the key facts uh, and the sources, and then use this to capture the learning models that you see as you go through these various training sessions. Um, the reason this works really well is if you think back to that ADCAR model that I talked about earlier on, this actually answers many of the steps that you go through from an ADCAR standpoint. In fact, if you want to create awareness, just go up to the topic description and you can become aware about what this single point lesson is about. If you want to create desire, then read the what, why you should care section and that will help me to convey to you why this concept that we're talking about is important. If you want to really start to impart knowledge, the key facts piece gives you a place to record a lot of the good knowledge that you want to take back. And the sources there at the bottom reinforce where this came from so that not only can you give credit for those who created it, but you can also help the people within your organization that maybe need to see that source to validate that this isn't just something somebody made up. So. Uh, just using a simple form like this that you cleaned out and cleared out and prepared to sit down through these sessions, you can create a lot of these single point lessons that you can take back and use to directly share within your facility. The other thing that I would recommend, um, I think it's really a, a, a great habit to go back and create a, a basically a toolbox topic and take some of the facts from the conference that you learned and just spend two or three minutes in your morning safety meeting taking individuals through some of the things that you learned. You could use these single point lessons, but you also could just use your notes from the section. 
But again, just reinforcing and providing this out to the bigger organization, not just uh, not just coming down and learning some great things for yourself. Awesome, and maybe we can um, you know provide these blank templates uh, to those that are coming down to the conference. That might be uh, something we could we could do ahead of time. So just something to think about. But um, Great. Um, so I did have someone asking when the CMRP exam is going to be given. So that will be on Thursday evening. So we'll wrap up all the content and everything. And I think we usually kick that exam off around 630. That way you got some time between when the sessions end and, uh, you know, to get some food and things like that. And then, then we dive right in and then everybody, you know, goes out uh, afterwards. So, um, but that's, that's when that's going to take place. And then someone else just chimed in. So obviously some interest here on the exam, which is awesome. Um, is there anything that you guys would suggest for preparing for the CMRP exam? So Sean, maybe I can let you t uh, tackle that one. Great. Yeah, the the exam uh, the exam's really designed to look at what you've learned as you've had experiences within your facility. So you don't necessarily have to buy a certain book and read through it, and it's not an open book exam where you've got to uh, you you've got to read just this specific book and find the answers within the book. It's really it's designed to be based on your experiences. But with that said, if you reach out to me, um, I do have a couple lists that I can provide to you that are, you know, it's 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 a list of books or a list of good good subjects to learn about. The other thing that I would suggest is go to the SMRP page. They have some test questions that you can try in advance and learn a little bit more about what to expect. And you can look at the body of knowledge because that body of knowledge uh, and the five categories that make it up, that's really where the exam questions come from. And I'll put my card up now just so if you would like, you can email me and I'll send you um, some of the material that, that we've created. Great. And um, so while people are kind of taking that down, taking uh, your info down, and before I take the screen back, just a couple other things that, that we didn't quite dive into. But as part of the conference as well, we've got a shared exhibit hall between the two events. Um, so just a great opportunity, you know, in between the sessions during the networking opportunities to meet with, um, you know, solution providers that are out there. Um, We've got Allied, Iridicio, Sean's company is going to be there, um, Desk Case, which they're the ones that are going to be there talking about the precision lubrication, um, Exascan, so he's the guy that's coming to talk about the electrical safety. So we've got, you know, a lot of these folks that are going to be there. Um, so just a great opportunity for you to see what, what new technologies, what new resources are available and, and get to meet the folks that are, you know, providing those, those things for you. Um, so that's always, you know, a nice little aspect to the event. And then and of course, I you know mentioned networking opportunities. That's also one of the highlights of of this these conferences. Um, you really do get tons of opportunities not only to network with the you know the solution providers that are there and the other attendees that are there, but I think what's unique about our events is um, because the the speakers are also participants. You really get great opportunities to have lunch with, have cocktails with, whatever the case may be, but spend a lot of time with the folks that you've just heard present on these different topics. And um, you don't necessarily get that at, at some of the bigger events that are out there. So I think that's kind of a nice nice little touch um, to our event that, that you can really, you know, certainly ask the questions at the end of a session, you know, the typical Q&A format, but but you really can, can dig in a little deeper and have some in-depth conversation with our, our presenters. So so um, that, that piece is really great, and, and hopefully you take advantage of that. And probably one of the best things about the conference, aside from all the, the wonderful things you're going to learn and the people you're going to meet, is the location. Um, Clearwater Beach, Florida in May is just about as great a place to be as any. The, uh, the conference hotel is right on the beach. Um, the sun sets because it's the Gulf of Mexico, so you get just the beautiful sunsets at night. Um, it's just, it, it's kind of the nice little icing on the cake at the end of the day. So, you know, we all work hard all day, you know, learning and in all the sessions and everything, but we definitely make sure you've got some time to get outside. Um, and one of those is our 
beach barbecue that we do. Um, so you get that time to network while you're watching that sunset. So uh, it, it is worth mentioning uh, that that piece is pretty nice and folks tend to like to bring their, their spouses to come down as well. So um, that's always a, a nice opportunity and we welcome that. So um, I'm going to take the screen back from you, Sean, real quick. Just I've got a couple closing slides here um, to to run you all through before I have you all head off to check how your brackets are doing. But, um, you know, we've got lots of information on, on our website, uh, uesystems.com on the, the some of the topics that Sean even talked about already today, different webinars and things like that that we've hosted. So if you want to continue to get a little bit more flavor of what you can expect, the website has a lot of that kind of detail on it. Um, so check that out. And, um, you know, we want to be sure we're all staying connected, answering questions, things like that. So we've got our Ultra Probe users group um, and our Reliable Asset World group on LinkedIn. Um, always good conversations taking place there. So, so kind of a good way to start networking before the conference. Um, and then we also have a, a Twitter account. Oops, sorry, uh, which is just at. Uh, UE underscore system. So check that out as well. And then here's our date. So we're going to do the ultrasound world preview webinar. Um, Adrian Messer and Doug Wagen from UE systems are going to be walking you guys through the different presentations that are going to take place there on March 30th. We'll get an invite out for that next week. And then of course the conferences. So, um, you know, save those dates. Hopefully, you know, people can join us. It's May 10th through the 13th again in beautiful Clearwater Beach, Florida. We've got a great rate at the hotel so hopefully everybody can take advantage of that and with that I'll leave our contact info up and if anybody has any questions anything else they want to learn you've got Sean's info if you didn't write that down you can get in touch with us and, and I can certainly get you in touch with him but uh, appreciate everybody taking some time out today to uh, to listen to what what we had to say and uh, Sean thank you again as well for for taking some time out and we'll look forward to Sean presenting and and uh, being in the exhibit hall as well at the event so hope everybody has a great St. Patrick's Patrick's Day. I hope everybody's brackets hold up well. And, uh, you know, I guess we'll see you all here in a couple weeks. Thanks.